When we think of the Aztecs, what comes to mind? Most people have an image of a warrior society and human hearts being ripped out of chest cavities atop pyramids on altars to appease gods that seem frightening and violent to us. Of course, most of the stories about the Aztecs are true. They were a warrior society that did perform daily sacrifices to their gods, but they were so much more. They were a people of strong religious conviction, lovers of art and poetry, enablers of education, and had a strong moral code. And overall, they believed themselves to be a people of destiny. In this video, we are going to discuss the juxtaposition of Aztec life and society and try to understand the reasons for their thoughts and beliefs. Welcome to Stranger History. If you like learning about our strange history, please like and subscribe to our channel. Now, when we talk about the Aztec Empire, we're usually referring to a specific group of people known as the Mexica, which is where the country of Mexico derives its name. Although the Mexica were the most powerful at the peak of the Aztec Empire when the Spanish arrived, they were not the only group within the empire. The ruling empire comprised three main groups, the Mexica from Tenochtitlan, the Alcahua from Texcoco, and the Tepanacs from Tlacopan known as the Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance, also known as the Aztec Triple Alliance, was a significant political and military confederation that played a crucial role in the formation and expansion of the Aztec Empire. Let's delve into the details of the Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance emerged in 1428 and was composed of three major city-states, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan. These powerful entities came together to form a strategic alliance, pooling their resources, military might, and political influence. Tenochtitlan, located on an island in Lake Texcoco, was the dominant city-state and the capital of the Aztec Empire. It was ruled by the powerful Mexica people, who later became known as the Aztecs. Texcoco, situated to the east of Tenochtitlan, was known for its intellectual and cultural achievements and was governed by the Acolhua people. Tlacopan, located to the west of Tenochtitlan, was a smaller city-state ruled by the Tepanec people. The Triple Alliance was founded on a shared desire for mutual defense, territorial expansion, and control over the surrounding regions. The member city-states cooperated strategically to conquer and assimilate neighboring territories, incorporating them into the growing Aztec Empire. The alliance was cemented through a complex system of political marriages and agreements. Intermarriages among the ruling families of the three city-states created familial ties, strengthening their unity. Each city-state had its own ruler, but the highest authority was held by the ruler of Tenochtitlan. The Triple Alliance operated under a system of tribute in which conquered territories were required to pay tribute in the form of goods, resources, or labor to the Aztec rulers. This tribute system fueled the economic and political strength of the Aztec Empire, providing resources for the maintenance of the ruling elite, the military, and the construction of monumental architecture. The Triple Alliance lasted for several decades until 1521 and played a pivotal role in the expansion of the Aztec Empire. Together, the member city-states conducted military campaigns, incorporating numerous regions and peoples into their dominion. The Alliance's military might, combined with its sophisticated political structure and effective governance, allowed the Aztec Empire to become one of the most powerful and influential civilizations in Mesoamerica. Now that we understand how the empire was structured, let's briefly discuss how they emerged as a Mesoamerican superpower. According to Aztec legends and oral tradition, the Mexica originated from a mythical place called Aztlan. Aztlan is believed to have been located in the northwestern part of Mexico, although its exact location is still debated among historians. Driven by their patron deity, Huitzilopochtli, the Mexica embarked on a migration in search of their promised land. The migration of the Mexica was arduous and spanned several generations. They faced numerous challenges and setbacks along the way, including conflicts with other indigenous groups and struggles for resources. As they journeyed through various regions of Mesoamerica, they absorbed cultural influences, adopted new practices, and gradually developed their own unique identity. After many years of wandering, the Mexica arrived in the Valley of Mexico in 1250. The valley was a region with a network of lakes and fertile land, making it an attractive settlement location. 
However, it was already inhabited by other indigenous groups and city-states, such as Tlatelolco and Culhuacan. According to legend, the Mexica encountered a prophetic sign while searching for a place to settle. They witnessed an eagle perched on a cactus, clutching a snake in its beak, an image that is now iconic and depicted on the modern Mexican flag. This sign, known as the Eagle on the Cactus, became a powerful symbol for the Mexica and provided divine validation for their chosen settlement site. The Mexica established their capital city, Tenochtitlan, on an island in Lake Texcoco. Now, originally, their place of settlement was an undesirable marshland surrounded by brackish water that they soon turned into a strategic location that would offer natural defenses and access to the abundant resources of the valley. The Mexica began to build their city, constructing canals, causeways, and impressive structures, transforming the marshy land into a thriving metropolis. Through alliances, diplomacy, and military conquests, the Mexica expanded their influence and gradually formed the Aztec Empire. They established a complex social and political system, with a ruling elite, a powerful military, and an intricate tribute system that extracted resources from conquered territories. Now, there is a lot more nuance and intricacies to alliances formed and broken during this time, but that's for another video. So now that we understand the political alliance dynamic of the Aztec Empire, let's look into their religion. Understanding one's spiritual beliefs will better help us understand the rhyme and reason of one's daily practices. The Aztecs had a complex and intricate religious system deeply intertwined with their daily lives. Their religion provided them with explanations for the creation of the world, the workings of the cosmos, and the relationship between gods and humans. Central to the Aztec belief system was the idea of a dualistic universe, divided into different realms. The cosmos was seen as a complex web of interconnected forces and entities, where gods, humans, and nature were all part of a grand cosmic order. Mythology played a vital role in Aztec culture explaining the origins of the world, the cycles of creation and destruction, and the feats of heroic figures. These myths were passed down through generations and reflected the Aztecs' understanding of their place in the universe. The Aztecs believed that the world had gone through multiple cycles of creation and destruction, with each era known as a sun, or age. These five ages were significant in Aztec mythology and provided a framework for understanding the cycles of life death and rebirth. The first age was the son of the jaguar or son of Tezcatlipoca. It was a time of the half-sun and making the first creation incomplete. Giants that ate only nuts and acorns roamed the land. This era came to an end when Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca began to fight and Tezcatlipoca was cast out of the sky. Tezcatlipoca angered, unleashed jaguars to destroy the giants, leading to the destruction of all life. Some stories say Tezcatlipoca even became a jaguar himself. The second age was the Son of Wind, or Son of Quetzalcoatl. In this era, fierce winds swept across the land, causing chaos and upheaval. The world was eventually destroyed by a hurricane-like storm, bringing an end to the second sun. The third age was the Son of Rain, or Son of Tlaloc. This era was characterized by abundant rainfall, which brought fertility and prosperity to the world. However, it was ultimately destroyed by a rain of fire, marking the end of the third sun. The fourth age was the sun of water, or sun of the Chalchiutliku. This era was characterized by abundant rainfall, which brought fertility and prosperity to the world. However, it was ultimately destroyed by a massive flood, marking the end of the fourth sun. The current age, the fifth and final one, is known as the sun of movement, or son of the Huitzilopochtli and the Aztecs' patron deity. It is the era in which the Aztecs lived. According to their belief, this age is destined to end in earthquakes, signifying the ultimate cycle of destruction and renewal. The story of Huitzilopochtli and his sister Koyolsaki is a significant myth in Aztec mythology. It narrates the dramatic conflict between the Aztec sun god Huitzilopochtli and his sister Koyolsaki, the moon goddess. The tale explains the origin of the sun and moon and symbolizes the eternal struggle between light and darkness. According to the legend, Huitzilopochtli and Koyolsaki were the children of the primordial earth goddess Coatlicue. 
when Kuatliku became pregnant with Huitzilopochtli, her other children, including Koyal Chauki, became jealous and plotted to kill their mother. As the story goes, Koyal Chauki led her siblings in an attack against Kotliku. However, upon hearing of their treachery, Huitzilopochtli, who was still in his mother's womb, sprang to life fully grown and fully armed. He emerged as a powerful warrior with a shining blue headdress adorned with feathers and a hummingbird-shaped shield. Huitzilopochtli swiftly defeated his siblings, dismembering Koyolchauki and throwing her head into the sky, where it became the moon. This act symbolized the triumph of the sun over the moon, light over darkness. Huitzilopochtli then chased away his other siblings, casting them down from the sacred mountain of Coatepec. The myth of Huitzilopochtli and Coyolxauqui represents the Aztec worldview and cosmology. It explains the eternal struggle between light and darkness, life and death, and the cyclical nature of the cosmos. Huitzilopochtli, as the sun god, embodies life, strength, and vitality, while Coyolxauqui, as the moon goddess, represents the cyclic nature of existence and the transformative power of darkness. This myth also holds deep cultural and political significance for the Aztecs. Huitzilopochtli was considered the patron deity of the Aztecs, and his victory over Coyol Xauqui symbolized the Aztecs' triumph over their enemies and the establishment of their power in the Valley of Mexico. So with all that being said, what is the one thing that Huitzilopochtli needed as fuel and energy to keep fighting darkness and to keep the sun rising every day? Yes, that's right, human blood and sacrifice. The Aztecs believed it was their divine duty to keep their gods fed, or the world would come to an end, and the world would be covered in darkness. The Aztecs didn't sacrifice human life because they disregarded it. On the contrary, they sacrificed human life because it was the most precious offering they could give to the gods. They believed that the human body was a sacred reservoir of divine forces called Tonali and Teolia. Tonali is said to be warm energy that radiates from the head. It is to be associated with one's strength and health. Teolia, on the other hand, is more associated with the human heart, like a divine fire inside correlated with reasoning and understanding. The concept of the five ages serves as a reminder of the cyclical nature of creation and destruction, with each era paving the way for the next. It highlights the importance of maintaining balance and harmony in the world to ensure its continued existence. While the Five Ages are mythological in nature, they were deeply woven into the fabric of Aztec culture and religion. They provided a framework for understanding the cycles of life and the impermanence of the world. So now that we understand the basis of Aztec religion, let's take a closer look at what everyday life was like for an Aztec. For this part, we'll be focusing more on Tenochtitlan of the Mexica people, since they were the dominant city at the peak of Aztec civilization. The Aztec Empire was a marvel of urban planning, engineering, and cultural sophistication. At the height of its power, the empire boasted a range of impressive amenities that contributed to the vibrant and thriving society of the Aztecs. The amenities and quality of life were unrivaled in the world. Let's explore some of the notable features and amenities of Tenochtitlan. One amenity that has always helped a civilization grow and prosper is access to clean water. Now, as we said before, the Aztecs originally settled on marshy land in the middle of a lake with brackish water. In order to overcome this obstacle, the Aztecs had to become masters of hydraulic engineering. They constructed an elaborate network of canals and aqueducts that crisscrossed their cities. These waterways not only facilitated transportation, but also provided fresh water for the city's inhabitants. But the water from the aqueducts wasn't for drinking. It was only for washing and cleaning. Drinking water came directly from the springs and was sold in the market. Water from the aqueducts was also used for agriculture, with chinampas, artificial islands, allowing the cultivation of crops. Chinampas were created by layering mud and vegetation, forming floating gardens for agricultural purposes. They were incredibly efficient and provided food for the growing population of the city. The empire boasted impressive causeways and bridges that connected its cities to the mainland. The Great Causeway, for example, linked Tenochtitlan to the mainland and served as a vital route for transportation and trade. It featured floodgates and drawbridges, showcasing the empire's engineering ingenuity. 
The Spanish were so amazed by the design that they called it the Venice of the New World. The city also had residential areas for the common people, arranged in a grid-like pattern. These neighborhoods featured small houses made of adobe bricks and thatched roofs. Canals served as waterways and transportation routes throughout the city, allowing people to travel by canoe. All homes, even the poorest of homes, were granted access to clean water. The Aztec Empire was renowned for its bustling marketplaces. The main market, Tlatelolco, was one of the largest and busiest markets in the region. Here, people from all walks of life gathered to trade a wide range of goods, including food, textiles, pottery, jewelry, and exotic items from distant lands. Education held great importance in Aztec society. Schools, known as Kalmakaks and Telpokkali, catered to the education of the noble class and commoners, respectively. Here, subjects such as history, religion, philosophy, agriculture, and military training were taught, fostering intellectual and cultural development. The Aztecs valued cleanliness and relaxation. Public baths and steam houses called Tamazcal provided a space for people to cleanse themselves and partake in rejuvenating steam baths and purification rituals. These practices were not only about physical cleanliness but also held spiritual significance. The Aztecs were a very clean people, but not only were the citizens very clean but the city was also immaculate. There were teams of public service workers dedicated to street sweeping and garbage collecting. Palaces and noble residences showcased the grandeur of Aztec society. These multi-story structures housed the ruling elite and nobles, featuring ornate decorations, expansive courtyards and beautiful gardens. They provided a glimpse into the opulence and power of the Aztec nobility. The gardens even had gardeners dedicated to maintaining their vibrance. The Aztecs were lovers of beauty and art. Songs and poems inspired them. Artists and poets were exalted. Revered artists were held in the same regard as famous warriors and kings. In the center of the city was the Quikali, or House of Song, an amphitheater for music and poetry. There was also a city zoo, with vast sections. Within the zoo were animals that were selected based on their symbolic and spiritual significance. It is believed that the collection included a wide variety of species, including birds, mammals, reptiles, and even exotic creatures from other regions. At the city center was Montezuma's palace. This palace, known as the House of Moctezuma or Hue Tsompantli, was a sprawling complex that reflected the power, wealth, and grandeur of the Aztec ruler. The palace was situated in the noble district of the city. It was constructed on a raised platform and had multiple levels. The lower level contained chambers and rooms for daily activities, while the upper level housed ceremonial spaces and private quarters for Moctezuma II and his family. The architecture of the palace featured stone and adobe construction, with intricate carvings, colorful murals, and elaborate decorations adorning the walls and facades. The palace was known for its exquisite craftsmanship, reflecting the artistic talent of the Aztec civilization. Within the palace complex, there were lush gardens, courtyards, and water features that provided a serene and visually pleasing environment. These outdoor spaces were meticulously designed and maintained, offering a respite from the bustling city outside. The palace also housed important administrative and governmental offices, as Moctezuma II was not only a ruler, but also a central figure in Aztec governance. Officials, advisors, and nobles would gather in the palace to conduct state affairs, receive audiences, and discuss matters of importance. All the public amenities, gardens, and palaces would be impressive on their own. But the one marvel that stood near Montezuma's palace that would draw the eye immediately was the Templo Mayor. This monumental structure served as the religious and ceremonial focal point of the city, and played a significant role in Aztec spirituality and governance. Surrounding the Templo Mayor complex were other structures, including smaller temples, ceremonial platforms, altars, and various auxiliary buildings. These structures served different functions, such as housing religious artifacts, accommodating priests and attendants, and storing ritual supplies. The Templo Mayor was dedicated to two primary deities, Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec sun god and patron deity of Tenochtitlan, and Tlaloc, the god of rain and fertility. These deities held great importance in Aztec cosmology, and the temple was constructed to honor and appease them through rituals, sacrifices, and worship. 
The temple complex consisted of two main pyramids that rose majestically side by side. These pyramids were known as the Templo de Huitzilopochtli and the Templo de Tlaloc. Each pyramid had its own staircase leading to a shrine at the top. The Templo de Huitzilopochtli, situated to the south, was dedicated to the sun god and represented the celestial and war aspects of Aztec belief. It was red and adorned intricate stone carvings, sculptures, and murals depicting various deities, mythical creatures, and historical events. The staircase leading to the shrine was steep and adorned with symbolic serpents and sculptures. The Templo de Tlaloc, situated to the north, was dedicated to the rain god and represented the earthly and agricultural aspects of Aztec belief. It was blue and had its own staircase, also decorated with serpents and sculptures, leading to the shrine at the top. Between these two pyramids was a sacred plaza known as the Cotopantli, or Serpent Wall, which was decorated with carved stone serpent heads. This plaza was an important space for ceremonies, rituals, and public gatherings. It was here that priests and nobles conducted sacrifices, offerings, and other religious ceremonies to honor the gods. Sacrifices were never conducted randomly or just occasional. It was practiced every single month. Some scholars and historians say they were even performed every day. Scholars estimate that around 20,000 people were sacrificed per year. Rituals were not all the same. It is said that there were 18 different ceremonies that involved ritual sacrifice. The Aztecs worshipped many deities, but there were five main gods that they would sacrifice to throughout their 18-month calendar. Each god required a different type of sacrificial ritual and festival. Huitzilopochtli was said to be a manifestation of the sun. He is said to have been celebrated at four of the 18 festivals. At the festivals of Huitzilopochtli, the victim would be led up the stairs of the Templo Mayor, covered in blue paint, where a priest with a surgically sharp obsidian knife would plunge the dagger into the chest and rip out the heart and hold it towards the sun. They then would push the lifeless body down the steps. The body would then sometimes be cannibalized by the capturing warrior. Tlaloc, according to the Florentine Codex, Tlaloc was highly revered and considered one of the principal deities in the Aztec pantheon. He was associated with life-giving rain, agricultural fertility, and the replenishment of water sources. The Aztecs believed that Tlaloc had the power to bring forth abundant crops and ensure the well-being of their society. Tlaloc required a certain type of sacrifice, that of a child's tears. If the child cried before being sacrificed, then it was said that the rain would be bountiful and the crops would flourish. Tezcatlipoca was said to be the god of night and the most powerful. In some rituals, victims would be tethered to a stone slab and armed with a feathered makuahuitl and forced to fight off jaguar and eagle knights that were armed with obsidian-laced makuahuitl. Needless to say that this would be an unfair fight. In another ritual, a young man would be dressed as Tezcatlipoca, given a flute to play and walk the streets of Tenochtitlan for a year, and adorned with luxury and women. In the one-year cycle to the day, the young man would climb the pyramid steps, break his flute, and surrender his body to the priests to be sacrificed. There were other forms of sacrifice involving the wearing of flayed skin, burning victims alive, and body dismemberment. But the purpose of this video isn't to go into full detail about sacrifice, but to give an idea of how contrarian Aztec society was on a daily basis. So now that we understand some of the religious aspects as to why there was so much bloodshed in Aztec life, let's take a look at some of the political aspects. Control and suppression. Human sacrifice allowed the Aztec rulers to assert and maintain control over their subjects. By demonstrating their power to demand and execute such sacrifices, the rulers instilled fear and awe among the population. It served as a tool of political suppression, reinforcing the authority and dominance of the ruling class. Social cohesion. Sacrifice played a crucial role in fostering social cohesion within the Aztec society. Public rituals and ceremonies centered around sacrifice provided a sense of shared identity, common purpose, and communal participation. They helped solidify the bonds among the different social groups, fostering loyalty and unity. Expansion of power. The Aztec Empire was built through military conquest and territorial expansion. Sacrificing captives from conquered territories served as a demonstration of power and a means to intimidate and subjugate neighboring peoples. 
It displayed the Aztecs' military prowess and served as a deterrent against potential rebellions or uprisings. Tribute and Redistribution Human sacrifices were often accompanied by the extraction of tribute from subject territories. The Aztecs imposed tributary demands on their conquered regions, including the provision of captives for sacrifice. This tribute system served as a means of resource redistribution, consolidating wealth and power within the Aztec capital and elite circles. It is crucial to recognize that these political reasons should not be viewed in isolation or as the sole motivations for the practice of sacrifice. Aztec religion, cosmology, and cultural beliefs played a fundamental role in shaping their worldview and understanding of sacrifice. Yes, the sacrifices were cruel and inhumane to say the least, but were they that much different from other cultures including modern Western? How many people have been killed in the name of God? How many families have been destroyed for natural resources? Just because we don't see the bloodshed on a daily basis doesn't mean it's not happening. The Aztecs believed what they were doing was essential to keeping their way of life. Seems that the difference between them and other cultures, including modern, is that the citizens had a better understanding of the sacrifice being made to continue their way of life. So what's your opinion on Aztec culture? Tell us in the comment section and remember to like and subscribe if you like learning about our strange history.